So the song is called "The March You Win a Key." It means that the the land um, is life. Life is a land, so it can go back and forth. <clears throat> In that song, we we um, it was given to um, me by a. My brother-in-law, when we did um, a water walk, 
And he has a story to that song and how it came to be and how the elders had put the words together. And he said that song's for anyone that's protecting the land. And, and it says, Anishinaabe Tibachimowen. It says, for as long as our, our Anishinaabe, and, and it's not talking just about the Anishinaabe here, it's talking about all the people, the different nations on the lands. It says, Tibachimowen, it says, for as long as they tell their stories, their teachings, their um, ceremonies, their songs, and um, would give life to the land and the life will give us life back forever will it travel on the land. So it's like Anishinaabe Tibachimowen. It says forever will it travel on the land. Kageke Pimuse Maga Bimachi Win Makio Heyo. So our people have been here for thousands of years and we've always had our songs, we've always had our ceremonies. Those things are very much still intact. But because of residential school, because of all the impacts of colonization and policies that have been put on us as a people, it's harmed our relationship with one another. It's harmed our relationship with our families. It's harmed our relationship to the land. And, and you see the people out there are struggling and, and it's because of those harms that were imposed on them and, and the fear that was instilled in our people. And then the policies where they tried to kill um, the Indian and the child, um, they just about succeeded, but it was our ancestors that had to go underground and, and take care of those ceremonies uh, until there, there were people that, um, we're ready to take them back and, and live in those ways of those ceremonies and those teachings. So we have songs that go back, like I said, uh, you know, like where our songs have helped us to be where we are today. And, and there's other means and ways, just like the book that Liz has created uh, alongside other people that have come to help her in the creation of this book and have given their stories, their testimonies. And um, I, I've walked alongside many settlers um, in the past and in the work that we do. And in, in the beginning, um, you know, my bio was shared about the protection of the lands, the waters, and indigenous rights and, and um, social justice issues. So I've walked with many different people in, in, the, in the past and still do, I'm not much, um, more in the uh, front line as I used to be in speaking out against these things. There's a new generation of, of young people that are, are, are sounding their voices out there that are doing things, you know, to bring attention. And, and a lot of times people are really uncomfortable, you know, in the things that we do, you know, like when I don't know more and, and the discomfort of blocking the roads, the streets, I should say, well, also the roads and railways and all these things that happen across the land. There's a lot of discomfort and, and the non-Indigenous people only felt a little bit of discomfort that we felt that has been going on, you know, since contact. And we've always been a target, you know, and, and I'm not wanting your pity. I'm not, you know, wanting your empathy. I, I, I'm, I'm stating some facts, you know, of where we are today and where we were in the past, it seems like a, the government is, is um, excuse me, I'm just lighting my, my sage here. <clears throat> the government, it's like a, a, a domestic violent relationship that we have. You know, they'll, they'll give us a little bit and then they'll take away and then they'll beat us down and then they'll give us a little bit and bring us up and then they'll beat us down. And that's what happens in a domestic um, violent relationship. Um, what I can actually say, it's, it's a colonial violence that's been <clears throat> imposed on us as a people that has harmed us and occupied us because of all the harms that we carry, the intergenerational trauma. And so it, it, 
it, it um, you know, it brings warmth to my heart when I know that the allies understand and that they're gonna stand beside us in, in the things that we do out there in, in, you know, in bringing justice or, you know, uh, uh, awareness to the things that are happening. So there's a little message here. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the message. So we've had a um, this colonial violent relationship and um, it's not settling down, it's still out there. You know, the racism that exists, the policies that exist, you know, the people that are, are, are privileged out there. You know, I, I, um, there was a lady uh, by the name of Nancy Rowe and um, I, I I came upon her message and, and it stayed with me for days. I couldn't let it go. I was really um, wondering if I should share that message, you know, and and in what we we feel or what we see out there and what is happening. And part of that is is the truth, you know, like sometimes we'd want to hear the truth. Again, it's uncomfortable uncomfortable, you know, that um that the uh, Settler privilege, you know, anyone that's working or benefiting from our dispossession of our, our lands and resources, you know, and where they are. Um, I believe that's a powerful statement that this um, woman made. And I, I really thought about it now thinking, it's true. You know, a lot of people live off our misery and our suffering, you know, and, um, and then the greater, you know, settler society, and I'm not talking about the settlers that you know have have come to know us as a people who have come stood beside us. You know, one of the um, our settler friends, Thor. You know, he's always there. You know, we've been walking with grassy narrows for many many years and trying to get justice for the mercury poisoning that's happened to them. And and Thor has never ever tried to overstep us or you know try to tell us what we need to do. He just always just say, what is it that I can do? Tell me what I can do. And so <clears throat> he was a, he was, I don't know, he's a great ally as a settler. And he, he understands this role in this society. And he acknowledges the fact that we as um, indigenous people, this is our homeland. And, and why I say that is like, I, I don't own the land, the land owns me. I belong to the land. You know, the creator, in our creation stories, the creator put us on this land. He didn't place us anywhere else. He placed us here on this land. We have ancestors that are being taken from our lands and we're just starting to find our ancestors in the universities and other places and we're bringing them home. And so they're as old as 10,000, 8,000 years old. And, and to know that, you know, that, that our ancestors have, have, have been here for thousands of years, you know, they, and all the other, um, you know, history that's been put on us and saying we came from the Bering Strait. It's coming from a non-Indigenous perspective where we know that, you know, our ancestors have been here. We have creation stories, we have creation songs. We have those, those ceremonies that, you know, we've inherited since time immemorial. Beautiful ceremonies, beautiful songs, beautiful teachings, beautiful stories of our creation as an Ishnabe. I always say, you know, this historians and the settlers, um, the ones that came here and, and, you know, searched for new land, they did us an injustice by trying to erase us as a people and make us look uh, less than human beings. And, and, and it was a catch for our resources, our lands. And then in, in all that, there was like that, that violence. You know, there's been so much violence um, on our people. And now you see the uh, result there. And the broccoli is yours, Sorry, this is the honest thing here. Somebody's on that speaking, so I don't know who that is. But um, there's that colonial violence that can, is, is, is still there. 
in the policies, in the systems, like I mentioned earlier, you know, and, and we're still at the bottom of the line of, of everything that happens here, you know, on, on Turtle Island. You know, um, look at the murdered and missing women, you know, um, and all those things that are in place, the resources that are being extracted, the water that's being poisoned, that's, that's colonial violence. You know, and and then the way that people look at our people, you know, um, oh my, there's another protester. Oh my, you know, like um, a rebel without a cause. Oh my, you know, um, it's a language that's out there too. You know that 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 harms us in what we're doing. You know, you have the people out there that are um, protecting, you know, the lands and the waters. And, and I always say this, um, you know, those, they're not only protecting it, protecting those waters and lands for the indigenous people, they're protecting it for everyone so that they can have water, clean water and, and have the same privilege of being out in the forest. And, and we need those trees, you know, there's massive logging going on and we need some of those elements, you know, the, not the elements, the minerals that are in the grounds you know, the earth needs us. There's a reason for everything. But yet you have multinationals coming in, governments making decisions and, and um, pushing aside indigenous people from those lands uh, and, and why they put them into reserves. And for me, you know, like it, it, it's been a long journey, but we, we haven't been alone. We've had a few settlers that have walked with us, that have helped us, you know, through communication, by standing in front of us in the front lines, by you know sitting with us and, and helping us, you know fundraise. There's many different roles that they played, you know, and still play in our lives, and in, in you know trying to get justice for some of the things that is a human rights where no one should you know have to suffer without clean water. You know, in, in Canada alone, there's so many water boil advisories. And, and they can make pipelines, but they can't make water lines. I mean, that's pretty disgusting to, to see and know that, you know, that we're pushed aside again, that, you know, there's major corporations that have more privilege than we have, you know, to have those pipes come into our communities and give us clean water. You know, I, I think of um, Show Lake, you know, and I always, I always um, you know, told my children, you know, you know, respect that water. I said, because there's people in Show Lake that are suffering without water. And I said, you're only allowed five minutes to shower. You can't run the water, you know? And, and my children got to understand, you know, as they grew up, they thought I was a little bit off, you know, making them shower only less than five minutes and mm, not running the water. And so now we have jugs where we fill up the water so they don't have to run the water that we drink the water out of those jugs. And so there's many changes I made, you know, and I have to walk my talk. I have to, you know, um, be a role model. And, and alongside, you know, my non-Indigenous um, brothers and sisters, the settlers, you know, it's been a great walk knowing that, you know, they come with us and they know the injustices. They know the privilege that they have and they know they can make a change. And they know that, you know, um, they also are part of the solution, not the problem of, you know, being part of the, the privileged um, society. So for me, it's, it's been a journey of, you know, um, understanding, you know, I, I never understood non-Indigenous people, the settlers, I remember this, this lady, and she was from a faith group. I asked her, why are you helping us? Why are you helping indigenous people? And she said, well, I think, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do, she says. You know, and, and I thought about that. You know, I thought, wow, what a, uh, what a great way to, of, of her to, to, say, to say that, to think like that, you know, that um, Jesus wouldn't, you know, uh, allow some of those injustices, Jesus would stand up. So 
that was like years and years ago. So I, I opened my mind, you know, in what I was doing. And when the not the non-indigenous people, the settlers asked to help, I, I would I would ask them, yeah, please, whatever you can do, you know, what can you do? I, I would ask, you know, how they can help. And so we would, you know, help one another and they would help us. So that's been my journey with the, the settlers is just finding out a little bit more about their, their faith, their humanity. You know, um, um, I always say this to the, the mothers, you know, you, you have a sacred vow that you make to your children. You, when, when they come into this world, you, you say to them, you know, I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to let no harm come to you. I'm not going to let anything hurt you. And that's that sacred vow you make to your child. But then, you know, you allow multinationals to come and poison their waters. And and do the injustices that they do to indigenous people. The ones that are trying to protect a way of life for everyone. You know, in our prayers, we pray for all life. So I call upon those mothers and I ask them, you made a sacred vow. How can you not you know, follow through in protecting the future. Their future. How can you allow those multinationals, those industries come and destroy their lands? We're always criminalized. We're standing up. For the waters, for the lands, for, for justice, for the lives of the people. Everyone's sacred, everyone's equal in my eyes. So I'm very happy you know, to be part of this journey with Liz. Liz. Liz and I sat for many hours. I shared stories of the settlers that I come to know that stood beside us, that tried to make a difference, that tried to bring awareness to the forefront among the other settlers. It's not been an easy journey, but I'm grateful for that journey because I've met some good people good settlers. And with this book, I pray that they'll open their minds and their hearts and see there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of water to save. There's a lot of land to protect. There's a lot of lives. Out there that need that support, that ongoing support and solidarity. I had CSIS come to me and I said, I'm just a grandma. I said, why would you come to me? I said, all I do is pray. I pray for your children and your grandchildren so that they can have a good life and have the same privileges that we did.
first I was afraid, then I got angry. I said, I'm just a little old granny. I don't do nothing. I said, I'm not a terrorist. And then they said, are you a terrorist? Why did you say that? I said, I'm not. So when we pray, we say, which includes every living thing out there, which includes the settlers. So it's a, it's a great thing, you know, for us and, and seeing what Liz is doing or trying to do and bringing forth, you know, these stories so it can help other people understand where they want to be. You know, do they want to be part of that problem or do they want to be part of the solution? I wish the best for Liz and all the, the people that took part in this, this book. I ask the ancestors to bless each and every one that took part of this book. I ask that they look after them, that they continue to work alongside indigenous people. That they have the courage to change the script, to be in the forefront I asked for blessings for each and every one of their families. There was a, a great lady that I sat with many years ago. She's a gunk when she was a, a clan mother, the late Louise Wawate. She said, There'll be a time that comes. He said, there'll be a, a bunch of chaos and people will want to go back to the land. And some of those prophecies have come true already. He says, all those ones that believe in Mother Earth, that believe in that water and believe in protection. He said, they'll be taken care of and their families, even the ones they forgot. They'll be taken care of. I hope this book does that. It opens the minds and hearts of the people. I ask those loving grandfathers and grandmothers, your ancestors, to help you and do what you need to do in making that change and creating the awareness that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Even just as one of the steps. I haven't read it yet, but I know that, you know, we've talked about the things in there. And I remember when Liz was writing it, you know, I got some of her scripts and I read through it and read through it and thinking, wow, you know, like I'm, I'm so blessed. You know, to know these people that are, you know, taking a step in, in ensuring justice, you know, in ensuring peace and harmony. I feel blessed and knowing Liz, and I hope that book, you know, it does amazing things out there. I ask those ancestors to take it wherever it needs to go to help the people, you know. I just want to say miigwech to each and every one of you that are out there. You know, this is new to me. I'm usually in the circles. I'm not a Zoom person. And I didn't know I was going to get emotional. <laughs> I just thought I was going to do the prayer and the song and say a little bit. But I, I thank you all for listening. You know, 
I thank you, Liz, for taking this, you know, a step further, you know, from your thesis to make it a book. I hope they make a movie. <laughs> I hope they make a movie one day about it. My wishes and my blessing for this book is that it, it goes where it needs to go and that it helps and heals the people and doing right, you know, by indigenous people. Miigwech. Miigwech, Chikiti, you shared some very powerful and profound words and messages. And I think that all of us can take away something from what you've said today. And um, I think most importantly, what you said is that we have a long way to go and a lot of work to do to take care of the land. And um, you might think you're a little old granny, but you're very powerful. I can feel it all the way in Sudbury over here. <laughs> Don't ever say you're a tiny little old granny because that's not true. And we're so lucky to listen to your words. Miigwech for the, that opening. Um, and I know Liz is very thankful over there too. I can see her um, just smiling. Um, next, I would like to introduce um, Beverly Rock. She's from Fer the Fernwood Publishing Company and she will share a few words with everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and deep gratitude to, to you, Chickadee, for that very, very powerful opening and sharing. Thank you. It's wonderful to see so many people here for this event tonight. Um, I only wish I was in Sudbury so I could have been in on getting one of those very cool living Indigenous sovereignty mugs and tea delivery. Um, I'm a settler. I live here. I'm coming to you tonight from uh, St. Margaret's Bay, Nova Scotia, on the unceded ancestral territory of the Nigma people. I feel very honored to be part of this event tonight, and, and we at Fernwood are so grateful that Liz and Gladys trusted us with publishing this really important piece of work. Living in Indigenous sovereignty makes a very important contribution to the the critical work of navigating this troubled relationship, you know, between Indigenous peoples and settler Canadians. We have a lot of work to do. There are many voices within these pages and we must listen. And as we learn from the forward, the purpose of this book is to critically engage with how to not only think differently, but to also be and do things differently. And I think that's a really important, very basic message for us all. The book is available for sale on the Fernwood Publishing website or from your local independent bookseller. If you're purchasing from the website, there's currently a 25% discount being offered as part of this launch tonight. Um, or you may be lucky and win one of the free copies that we'll be giving away this evening. So we have a great program ahead of us. So let's begin by giving away a copy of the book. So Michelle, uh, back to you to let us know who the lucky winner of the first copy of the book. Miigwech, Beverly. Let's do it. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we will do the draw. If I can figure it out, here we go. Share. Mm, that's not it. That's not it. Mm. Here we go. So this first draw is for um, everyone who is here today. Anyone who signed up for um, this book launch will have their name entered. I didn't have enough time to enter their full last names. There's over 208 people entered in this draw. Um, so it's just an initial. So I'm going to shuffle it. And here we go. J. 
Gislaine. Congrats. So G, if you want to um, send a message to Tanya or myself in the private chat, send me your address and we can get you a copy of the book. That's so awesome. Congrats. Um, the next thing I'd like to do is stop sharing. There we go. And then I will introduce uh, the author, Liz. So Elizabeth, also known as Elizabeth Carlson Manathera, she is Swedish, um, Sami, German, Scott Irish, and has also English ancestors who settled on lands of the Anishinaabe and the Omaha nations, um, which were unethically obtained in the US by the US government. Her scholarship is focused on the anti-colonial and decolonial work of settlers um, and anti-colonial social work practice and research methodologies and anti-colonial public education through film. Liz is currently learning to live in Indigenous sovereignty as a treaty relative of the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 while working as an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at Laurentian University. So now I will pass it off to Liz to say a few words. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you so much, Chickadee. It was just so beautiful what you shared. And it's been so long since I've heard the drum because of COVID and it just um, really touched my heart listening to you speak. So thank you so much. And for the fine job that Michelle is doing and to Bev for um, representing the publisher and um, like Bev was uh, involved in so many discussions that we had as we were kind of finalizing different aspects of the book. And I really appreciate everyone at Fernwood who has been um, so, so wonderful and so wonderful to work with. So um, it's so good to see so many familiar faces. I was just kind of going through the, um, the different pages of the participants and there are so many people that I know and love, you know, and um, it's so good to see you. And I thank you all for coming and, and for offering your support and for your interest in, in this work. Um, so I'm joining you today from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory of 1850, also known as Sudbury, Ontario or Swakwak and um, on sovereign Anishinaabe lands. And I wanted to thank you for coming to celebrate what I think of as our book. And I'm going to um, share something here on my screen to tell you what I mean when I say our book. See if I can get the right window because otherwise we might be sharing uh, things we don't want to share. <laughs> so, um, so when I say our book, like, this book has been birthed by a whole community of people. And I get frustrated sometimes with the kind of the, the way that the um, academic systems work with authorship. And we tried to do what we could to, um, to try to disrupt that a little bit. Um, so, but like, this is really the author right here, you know, and all of these folks and more. Um, so um, I think about, you know, of course, the co-author Gladys Rowe, who is so involved in the research behind the book and so involved in um, the film project that accompanies the book and then in the, in the development of the book itself. And she um, wasn't able to be here tonight. She's trying to safeguard her workload a little bit, and she's been involved in a number of events around the book already. So um, I certainly understand that. Um, but um, like this whole community is who I consider to be the co-authors and they've been amazing collaborators from engaging in consultations that help design the research behind the book and Chickadee was part of that um, to helping to shape the values and the messages behind the book um, to taking part in community feasts and ceremonies around the book um, to writing the literature that helped inform the book and my own journey with this work. And of course, um, those that were involved with editing and the publishers that helped the book to become the best it could be within its final stages. So I don't know if you can see the names, there's an awful lot of them, but um, like this first group of people was so foundational in, in many aspects of the book, but um, especially in consultations as the, as the research took shape and in um, the, a lot of the feasts and gatherings that we had. Um, this group right here were the folks who, um, who were interviewed um, for the research and whose stories appear in the book. So they're each featured in one of the chapters. 
And then this group here, and I could I could really add a lot more to this, I think, but these are folks whose um, who's, who's writings and, um, and um, spoken words have really influenced my thinking and, and influenced the book and they're cited quite a bit in the book. And then this group here, um, here's my, um, my dissertation committee and my external who, my external um, evaluator who's here on the call too. My, Tula is here I saw and maybe some of the other members of the committee. Um, and um, Teddy who's involved in the film project, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and like all these beautiful people who helped with the feast, Carolyn who helped with, um, we did a lot of sewing around this project and Carolyn was a big part of that because we, you know, reciprocity was such a value for us in the way that we did our research. And so to be um, offering gifts and to acknowledge people's time in that way. Um, so, and some of these folks here were also involved in the um, consultation when, the, when, when we started the, um, the, the research. And then some of these folks here, uh, their um, scholarship has really impacted my thinking and my growth. And I think of them as, as another community that um, that I'm involved with that um, has done a scholarship in the areas that the book that the book kind of follows. Um, so settler scholars who are really engaged in decolonial work and trying to make those changes. And then the folks from the publisher here. So, so many people have been involved in the book and I just wanted to um, point, point a lot of folks out. Um, let's see here. I, I kind of went off script, so now I got to find my place. Um, <laughs> Um, I also wanted to point out, um, I'm, M.A. Craft is going to, we're going to be sharing some of her words in a little while, um, but um, she's in this group and Leona Starr and Donis Kennedy and these three provided really key insights um, that became um, threads that were woven throughout the book. So I wanted to point them out too as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, many people who are part of the book are here on this call tonight. So I want to recognize you and honor you. Um, Let's see here, I got to catch up to myself. So um, so some of the key moments in the book, like I said, were the interviews with 14 um, non-Indigenous people and it ended up being 13 in the book. Um, and one of these um, folks is going to be um, sharing some words tonight, Victoria Freeman. I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. And then um, Chickadee mentioned that she she's interested in a movie. And so Chickadee, your dream has come true. <laughs> There's um, there is a film project that accompanies the book and it's the stories of decolonization film project and I'm gonna um, well I'll, I'll show it right now. This is the website and I put the web address there so a lot of the people who are interviewed within the book and who took part in the um, In the community around the book have interviews that are featured in the stories of decolonization film project and the first film in the project is already out and it's available through our project website, you can view it for free. And we're finishing up on the second film this fall. So we're really excited about that. But it's just another way to get the word out there and make it accessible for um, Canadians to, to start to learn about colonialism and decolonization and how to, how to change our, our, our understanding of ourself and of these lands. Um, two other really key moments in the research process that, that is affiliated with the book have been the two community feasts. And these were held in Winnipeg. And during the first um, feast in December 2015, Chickadee shares some words and saying, Dabasanaquat or Peter Atkinson led us in a water drum ceremony. And there were um, four pipe carriers who, who led us in, in a, a pipe ceremony. Sherry Copenhagen from Treaty 3, Belinda Vandenbrock, Don Robinson, and Dabasanaquat also, or Peter Atkinson. And so like that was really key. And I just want to say that it is my firm belief that it was those feasts that have propelled this work forward, that it was the, the prayers of those folks um, and, and Chickadee as well, the prayers that, um, that carried this work forward to be able to reach the audience that it's, that it's starting to reach. Eh? So I'm really grateful for that. Um, we had our um, second feast in December, 2017. Here was the poster from that one. Um, and what happened with that feast was that it was after the research part was completed, the dissertation was completed and all of that. And then it, it was at that moment when, when it was like, okay, we're gonna move forward. Like I was interested in moving forward to, to the dissertation becoming a book. And so then I said, well, I can't make that decision by myself. There's a whole community involved in this. So that's why we held that feast was to come together again, to have ceremony together again and prayers and talk to one another again 
And, and the big question was, how does the community feel about this going forward into a book? And that's where we got the kind of the community sanction to move forward. So that was a really important um, moment in the, in the research and the, the process of the book coming to be as well. So I'm just gonna stop sharing here so that I can come back here. Okay, so I did wanna share just um, a, few, um, a few brief passages from the book um, and then, um, and then I'll, I'll close off my remarks in a few minutes. So um, just from the very beginning of the book the first page of the, of the first chapter, says um, Canadian journalist, author and activist Naomi Klein began her sold out talk to a Winnipeg audience in April of 2016 by acknowledging that they were gathered on Treaty 1 territory and challenging the audience with the words, it is not enough for us to simply say that this is indigenous land, we need to act like it's indigenous land. At an Anishinaabe water gathering, Donis Kennedy suggested a paradigm shift for non-indigenous people. She said, rather than seeing um, ourselves solely as main characters in um, the stories of non-Indigenous people, that um, we should consider seeing ourselves as characters in the stories of Indigenous people. The idea of living in Indigenous sovereignty, which represents a powerful shift because as non-Indigenous people begin to see ourselves in this way, then we can begin to sow the seeds of a different reality. Indigenous sovereignty just is regardless of Canada's opinion. Recognizing and living this can serve as an orienting framework for settler lives and relations. Living in Indigenous sovereignty is living in an awareness that we are on Indigenous lands, containing their own stories, relationships, laws, protocols, obligations, and opportunities, which have been understood and practiced by Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. As Canada increasingly grapples with its relationship to Indigenous law and Indigenous sovereignty, settlers who wish to live in Indigenous sovereignty are engaging in a process of reorienting our lives toward Indigenous lands, Indigenous stories, relationships, laws, governance, resurgence, treaties, prophecies, and protocols, or as Donis Kennedy said, thinking of ourselves as stories and the char characters in the stories of Indigenous peoples. But what are these stories and how do we learn about them so we can orient, them, orient to them? This is a process of courageous listening. And while it can start as it does here with the book with the words of indigenous scholars, knowledge holders and activists, it must soon move off the page and into relationship. So um, I just wanted to, to um, offer a different perspective on the book as well and say that um, I've often heard Indigenous people talk about the amount of time and energy that they spend trying to educate settlers and settler organizations on the basics around colonialism and decolonization and how sometimes um, this is demanded or expected of them that they do this labor. Um, I'm hoping that the book and then the film project that's, um, that's associated with with the book will serve as educational resources to which folks can refer settler friends and acquaintances as well as non-Indigenous colleagues. And I'm hoping that these resources can be one element of a growing movement for decolonization and good relations. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you for listening to, um, to the comments that I had to offer, miigwech bizindawiyeg. And what I'm going to do is introduce Emma Kraft. Um, she was planning to speak live, but um, we had some um, miscommunication around time zones and um, realized a few hours ago that it was going to conflict with something else that she had to do tonight. So um, what she did is she recorded some words and I'm going to share the recording that she has, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce her first. So M.A. Kraft is an Anishinaabe Métis lawyer from Treaty 1 Territory in Manitoba. She is an associate professor at the Faculty of Common Law, University of Ottawa, and is a leading researcher on Indigenous laws, treaties, and water. She holds a university research chair, Nibe Minowa Aki in Akunagewin, Indigenous Governance in Relationship with Land and Water. Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty, her award-winning book, which I have right here, holding it up, <laughs> um, focuses on understanding and interpreting treaties from an Anishinaabe and Akunagewin or legal perspective. Treaty Words, her critically acclaimed children's book, which just came out, explains treaty philosophy and relationships. And that's this book here. I recently attended her launch of this book. It's a beautiful children's book. So I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen to, um, to share her, her words here. Just one second here. There she is. I'm gonna click 
share sound. Okay. So I'm hoping that this works as, as seamlessly as I envision. I'm gonna go ahead and press play and we'll listen to her words. Um, I am very happy to extend some greetings and to join you, although remotely, uh, in celebration of this amazing book. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, Liz and Gladys for the amazing work that they've done, and also um, some women who have co-authored the foreword with me, Leona Starr and Donis Kennedy. Uh, my name is Amy Kraft. I'm an associate professor at the University of Ottawa. I'm also a research chair in uh, Nibi Minowaki Nakanagewin, that's Indigenous governance in relation with land and water. And I want to um, acknowledge the hard work and commitment to uh, not only getting a book out, because that's a, a huge deal and it should be a great celebration today. Uh, but also for the challenge of the ideas that this book is picking up. Uh, a few years ago, six years ago, the TRC uh, reminded us that the framework for reconciliation is found within the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that that's intimately connected to self-determination and sovereignty of Indigenous people and their respect for human rights. And the ability to continue to live treaty relationships, to have those treaties honored and to be in connection with land and territory in meaningful ways that reflect indigenous laws and legal orders. Um, what the TRC also said is that, you know, the change uh, that's required, the change that will help us engage uh, mutually respectful relationships over time, ongoing relationships as part of reconciliation, that that is gonna actually require some shifts in how society is currently constructed. And it's going to mean some setting aside of uh, cultures of denial and outdated doctrines that underlie, uh, for example, our Canadian legal system and our social systems, uh, economic systems, et cetera, in, in Canada. Um, and this book takes up, I think, the very important task of how we're going to navigate those relationships uh, between Indigenous peoples and settler Canada into the future? And how do we step away from spaces of colonial violence and into respect for Indigenous governance, Indigenous economies, Indigenous relationships with land and territory, and to think about what it is to have space in that as a settler ally? And I know for many that's been a really difficult question to engage with, some have been hesitant to the point of leaving things in the guilt box and not journeying forward into um, the difficult relationships and the possibility of making mistakes or of offending people or of doing the wrong thing. Um, it takes a whole lot of courage to be a powerful ally. And I wanna recognize uh, those who have shared their stories in this very important book, um, their stories of success and also stories of uh, experience and learning about how to do things better uh, into the future. So uh, I, I'm i really grateful for uh, the work that's been done and I think that it points us to um, an opportunity to continue to work uh, and not only be different uh, but do things uh, differently into the future. Uh, and this is not just about ideas, it's, it's about action. Um, for me, you know, I rest a lot of this in the hope for a return to Indigenous governance uh, and relationships with lands and territories. And I know that uh, one of the efforts that's spoken to in the book and in some of the following work has been to re reinvigorate treaties, support the treaty litigation uh, and the honoring of treaties and to look at land back as a viable option for understanding what this redefined relationship might look like. And all of that I think is an important way of capturing what reconciliation is meant to uh, achieve in repairing those past relationships and journeying towards that real societal change. Some of the core questions that we get called upon to answer regularly um, 
is, you know, what is it going to take to reach uh, into spaces of reconciliation? How can non-Indigenous or settler allies do more and do better? Um, and I think collectively we should be grateful for this book as a resource uh, to begin to further uh, these journeys of supportive Indigenous people and Indigenous sovereignties. Recently, um, I was reminded that um, what we can learn from the land is so incredibly powerful and everyone has access to that, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. And developing those relationships with lands and territories and developing relationships with people that are responsible and whose ancestors have been responsible for those, those lands and territories for millennia is uh, another core piece of redefining that relationship. And so I want to um, acknowledge that as part of this very important equation. I know that today you're gonna hear about some different journeys and different paths towards um, fulfilling that settler ally responsibility. And I hope that each of you will take some inspiration from that in terms of uh, co-creating those uh, relationships and those actions uh, together. I want to say that uh, Liz herself has been an amazing ally and friend and has um, always been very respectful in the parameters of relationships and, and doing this kind of work and knowing where to step into space respectfully and collaboratively in taking that responsibility as as an ally, as a good ally, and uh, I'm grateful for that. And so to celebrate uh, Gladys and, and Liz in, in this amazing effort, I want to say miigwech. Um, this is a, a fabulous day, and I wish I could be there in person to celebrate with you, but I hope that each of us will hold that book, um, read it, and build on it uh, because our collective future depends on that and where our future generations are going to be, where they're gonna end up is dependent on this moment in time. It's so critically important to think about redefining these relationships based on nationhood and an acknowledgement of the lands and territories and waters um, that we all belong to. So miigwech, enjoy the celebration. We'll see you again. I see I'm on mute. Uh, so I think it, I think I'm handing it back to Michelle now. Is that right? Yes. So last but not least, thank you. I'm so glad that MA could uh, send in that little video. Um, it's so nice to hear from her. Next, we'll go um, to Victoria and I'll do a introduction to Victoria Freeman. She's a writer, historian, theater artist and activist. She is the author of Distant Relations, How My Ancestors Colonized North America in a World Without Martha, a memoir of sisters, disability, and difference. She researched and co-wrote two plays, The Talking Treaty Spectacle with Angie Loft, Joan Lee's Theatre, and Birds Make Me Think About Freedom. Um, with Angie Loft, she co-wrote the film by these presents, purchasing Toronto, and with Andrew Loft and Martha Steigman, is co-creating and illustrating an adult pop book, a treaty guide for Torontonians, which is coming out in 2022. She is currently conducting research for a project with York University, the Mississaugas of the Credit, Six Nations, Chippewa of Rama, Mississauga of Sugog. Uh, Black Creek Pioneer Village in order to change the narrative of that heritage site by bringing regional Indigenous history and history of local Indigenous and non-Indigenous relations into its interpretation and exhibits. So now I'll give uh, Victoria a chance to talk about her a section in the book. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, okay. Uh, I want to introduce myself first. I'm Victoria Freeman, uh, definitely a white settler. Uh, my ancestors have first came to North America in the 1630s. Uh, I think I'm the 13th generation to be here. Uh, so uh, my family has been very involved in 
the whole process of colonization uh, for generations. And that is my inheritance. And uh, I acknowledge that. Um, I'm talking to you from Toronto. Um, so I also want to acknowledge that uh, I'm on uh, Indigenous lands. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, uh, peoples of this region, uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit. This is Treaty 13 territory. Uh, I acknowledge their deep ties to this land that they've cared for for millennia. And I um, really struggle to uh, learn myself how to be a responsible person on this land and how to protect it and how to work towards uh, a just relationship between our peoples and the land. Um, so I, I wanna start off uh, also thanking uh, Chickadee. Uh, your words really helped to ground me. I, I needed to hear those words tonight and to have a sense of the reality that Indigenous peoples in lots of places are encountering. Um, I'm here in my bubble in Toronto um, and I'm so removed from all of that right now. So I, I just wanna really thank you, Chimi Gwach. Um, I also want to, uh, well, obviously I wanna thank Liz for inviting me to participate. And, and I also wanna acknowledge um, Renata Eigenbrot, uh, the late Renata Eigenbrot, who first introduced Liz and, and me uh, back in Winnipeg quite a number of years ago. And uh, she was a, a white person, a white ally who I learned from uh, and who also supported me in the work that I do. So I just want to acknowledge her. Um, in fact, when I first started thinking about what I was gonna say tonight, I wrote this long list of all the people to thank. And I, I, I don't have time to, to go over all of the people who, who have helped me so much. Um, you know, indigenous people who have really um, challenged me at times, but also worked with me and uh, many of whom have stood by me when I really screwed up. Um, I also want to acknowledge those who don't wanna work with me anymore. Um, and, <laughs> Uh, you know, I've learned from them too. And uh, I want to just acknowledge that trying to work in alliance, trying to do this work, I find really difficult, challenging work. I've been doing it for 41 years now, since I first heard Maria Campbell speak at the Vamp School of Fine Arts in 1980. Uh, and I still find it really hard sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And, uh, and not just in the past, like in the past week, I've been going, oh, can I, can I do this? Can I keep doing this? Um, today I can, <laughs> and, and I, hope to, I, I hope to keep trying. Um, so I just wanna say that sometimes we are able to make progress together, uh, working together uh, on projects and sometimes we're not. And I've had both of those experiences uh, more than once. Uh, so um, I also want to acknowledge uh, a lot of the uh, people like Renata, other white would-be allies who have uh, supported me and, and who I've learned from. Uh, not only people of my generation, but even people from earlier generations uh, who I didn't necessarily know, but I, uh, some of them I've, I've heard of and some of them I've learned from, learned about since. Um, so again, so many of them, some of you are here tonight, hello, um, but I, I don't have time to, unfortunately to name you all tonight, but so many thanks. Um, so, I guess my point in just saying that there are so many people to acknowledge is that I can only get so far on my own. Um, I've needed the, the input and the vision of many other people to learn how to work in alliance and I'm still learning. Uh, 
if I have any message to share with people, it's that this learning is never over. You never become an expert. <laughs> the landscape is always shifting and changing. And you'll probably continue to screw up from time to time, at least if you're uh, like me. Uh, and I'd say also the covenant chain of alliance always will always need repolishing. So um, I mentioned I've had lots of uh, bumps along the way. Um, and I recognize that part of this also is my own particular upbringing. Uh, the ties of my, to my own social class and family have made it difficult at times for me to have the clearest analysis of how to be a good ally or what's going on, how to support. Uh, I've had a lot of unlearning to do, and I just, maybe even more than a lot of other people. I grew up uh, in Ottawa. My father was a, a deputy governor of the Bank of Canada. I was at the center of power and white power in, in, in Canada. Uh, I grew up expecting that I would be a mover and shaker. Uh, I took all kinds of my privilege, social privilege, economic privilege, et cetera, white privilege for granted. Uh, and I've, over the years, I've really had to sort of temper my expectations of how I should be involved, what role I should play. Uh, I'd have to say what I have wrestled with the most in being an ally is myself. Um, and that uh, my reactions to various things, my ego needs, um, the ways I get triggered uh, when there are moments of confrontation, not always because I am denying what's going on or denying the reality of colonization, but also because I have my own trauma that sometimes surfaces childhood stuff. I talk a little bit about it in, in, my, in the book. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, on the topic of white fragility, I would say it's complicated. Uh, Lee Maracle uh, and other people have spoken about colonialism as also a psychological structure, as well as a, a social structure, a political structure, an economic structure. Um, and uh, that's often where I get caught up um, and, and what I've had to work through. Um, but I have seen enormous change and, and I, and, you know, Chickadee reminds us of how much more needs to be done, like this, the in sense of crisis on, on the land of you know, so many things that are so important and so vital. But I also want to say that things have also changed a lot. When I started out, um, there was, uh, I didn't know any other allies. Um, like. <laughs> I, and and I, when I would bring things up, I felt like a traitor to my family, to my community. Um, I think it's changed a lot since then. Uh, when I was growing up, I only, I didn't know indigenous people. I just knew about um, drunk people on reserves. Like that was the image that I had. Um, and good liberals discussed the plight of indigenous people and, and you know, talked about how they, what they could do to help, but in that, that, that way of that same sort of civilization and protection discourse that uh, caused a lot of the problem in the first place. Um, and, and I'm really heartened that now that that has changed a lot. The discourse is like now the focus is on us, on white supremacy, um, on, uh, you know, undoing and, uh, you know, uh, the structural and economic racism that benefits us uh, and and disempowers and dispossesses and exploits indigenous peoples and their lands. So I do see a real shift there. Uh, also, when I started, um, there was a huge silence on the part of white people about colonialism and racism. Uh, and uh, it was sort of like a, a crime that happened all by itself or it, colonialism was supposed to be good for the people who were colonized. So I think that that has shifted quite a bit too, uh, not in all circles, but in a lot of circles. And I think uh, social media has played a huge role in amplifying indigenous voices uh, and also the role of indigenous scholarship and indigenous scholars. 
um, they can now bypass a lot of the gatekeepers, uh, including white allies. Uh, and, and I think that's really important. Um, anyway, I learned by, uh, I learned from German people who tried to understand what had happened in their country in terms of uh, Nazism and the Holocaust. Because I think there are, you know, we're talking about a Holocaust too. We're talking about a genocide, an, an attempted genocide. Uh, and I just feel that, um, you know, there were the people who actually did it didn't feel guilty, but sometimes the, the children or the grandchildren of those people felt guilty or were confused about what was their relationship to that history. And that's something that I've really struggled to understand is what is my connection to this long history of colonialism? And then of course, realizing, well, it's not over. Um, we need to acknowledge the past and we also need to uh, absolutely confront our relations in the present. Uh, so um, I've spent my life trying to challenge that denial of responsibility across the generations. Um, and you know, to remind us all that nobody has clean hands, that, that we, uh, we're not responsible for what our ancestors or our culture did, um, uh, but we're accountable now for what we do with where we are today with our privileges and benefits uh, of those actions. Uh, so um, I also just wanna say um, that I think uh, one of the, the benefits of Liz's book and her approach is in allowing white activists to speak as well is acknowledging the role that um, we can play for each other. There are many times when uh, our reactions may not be appropriate, you know, when we are, uh, thank you, um, but we, um, But we, but we can help each other to decode and to um, change our behavior or to just work through and process um, our misunderstandings or our reactions. I just wanna tell one very quick story. And that's about how uh, it's easy to be focused on our failures. And I, uh, I am certainly guilty of that, but sometimes we are awed by the far reaching results or ripples of our actions. Uh, Lee Maracle and I developed a course um, called uh, The Politics and Process of Reconciliation that we taught at U of T way back in 2010, 2011. And there was one student in that course who was an indigenous person from Burma. I've stayed in touch with her over the years. She went in, in that course, she really found her voice and found her identity as an indigenous person. She went back to Burma and became a human rights worker. Uh, I've stayed in touch with her, but I was very aware, very worried when I didn't hear from her for a while during, after the coup, et cetera. Recently, she just phoned me and said that she, she is safely in Canada. Uh, she had to leave because she was very involved in the protests there and uh, was also chosen by her people to be a representative to the national unity government that the coup is now calling a terrorist organization. But she, the thing that was amazing to me was that she thanked me and Lee for the role that we played in helping her find her strength. She took, and she said that she relied on the knowledge that she gained through that class in the organizing work that she did in Burma. I am so uh, floored by that. That uh, and, and I and I know that um, I'm totally awed by her courage and her de determination. And now she's the teacher, I'm the student, and um, I just I just I'll just end by saying, you never know where your work is going. You never know. It can feel like you've done nothing, but sometimes you've done something. Let's keep uh, help each other in grow in strength and determination. Let's challenge each other to do better and try not to tear each other down, but build each other up. 
um, let's keep trying no matter what, as the earth is devastated by climate change and appalling inhumanity here and around the globe. I'm not hopeful in some ways, but I'm determined to keep trying. Uh, and I hope you will too. Thank you. Me, Gwich, Victoria, I'm looking forward to reading your chapter. It's chapter 18. I, uh, I'm on chapter three. So maybe I should have worked backwards for this uh, launch. But thank you for your words. Um, next, I will pass on to Liz, back to Liz, who will thank the small group of people, her team in uh, Sudbury here. All right, so I just wanna thank you so much, Victoria, for, um, for being here and for sharing and for all that you did um, with the book and with your chapter. I, I really appreciate your work. And, um, you know, when you said that, I was like, oh no, I got to add Renata to that list of the community because I do remember. And it was just the other day that I came across that email exchange that we had. I don't know, was it 2013 or something maybe? You know, it was a long time ago. And um, yeah, Renata, Renata certainly had her role, absolutely. So thank you for bringing, bringing her up. So. Um, as we move towards um, the final two draws for our remaining prizes and transition into the question and answer and discussion part of tonight's launch, um, I just wanted to say a word of thanks for all of those who made this launch possible and also to recognize everyone who's attended because um, like I'm seeing, you know, some people, I'm seeing all these beautiful notes, um, you know, some of them are privately messaged and some of them are for everyone, but just the beautiful community that's here. And um, I know some people came at the beginning and had to go and some people are joining us a little bit late, but thank you to all of you for coming. And this is um, being recorded other than um, Chickadee's section. We wanted to respect um, that space for her prayer and, um, and, and everything. So um, it, we, but the, the goal is that this will be put onto the Fernwood um, webpage so that people who maybe missed something, you'll probably be able to pick it back up again. And I was just looking, um, you know, I'm not seeing everyone at once on my screen, but Grandma Shingus is here. Yay. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Um, so, and she's um, been such an amazing um, activist and leader in Winnipeg. And I, I miss Winnipeg so much when I see people like Grandma Shingus and Chickadee and, and everyone that that I worked with and, and was lucky to, to know in Winnipeg and, and uh, yeah, I miss people. So um, I wanted to um, thank um, all of those who have spoke, of course, Chickadee again, and May, Victoria, um, and also the people who, um, who planned this launch. And I have some amazing colleagues and friends, um, Dr. Tanya Shute and Dr. Joey Lynn Wabi and Judy Morrissey, um, who, who did a lot of work for this launch. And I'm gonna talk about some of that in a moment, but also um, again, the folks at Fernwood and many people from Fernwood were, were involved in this launch. Um, so I wanna acknowledge um, Anumehe Gohal, Gokal, I hope I'm saying her name right. Um, she's in India right now and probably asleep. Um, Oyenda Alaka, who, um, who uh, helped us in the beginning stages, Fazila Jiwa, and of course, Beverly, Rock or Rock, I don't even know if I'm saying your name right. I should have consulted on these before, but thank you so much for, for everyone's role. So um, Joey Lynn and Judy, and also um, Nicole um, Chatelaine McDonald. Um, so Joey Lynn came up with this idea of these tea bundles to be delivered to the first 20 registrants in Sudbury. Eh? So um, I'm really grateful to them for um, pursuing that idea and spending so many hours putting together these bundles and these mugs, they're so beautiful. And it's the first time that I heard about something called Cricut that looks like CryCut, this machine that makes things. And they use this machine that makes things to do these mugs. Um, and yesterday we're running all around town um, delivering these tea bundles to the, those first 20 registrants from, um, from Sudbury. So this is the mug that they made. And um, on the back, it has kind of that, um, that um, the island that's in the forefront of the, of the book um, cover. So I just think it's beautiful. And these, like they, they, um, they made that, you know, it's so amazing and so many hours. So I wanna thank them. And also um, Eugenia, um, Eugenia, I think I saw her on the call, um, Eshkwaken, I hope I'm saying it sort of right. And Eugenia um, was so fabulous. I know I lost it, but Eugenia created these um, 
this page of kind of um, recommendations for um, settlers who are wanting to do this kind of work. And it's like just a page of some ideas that, um, that might help people in guiding their work that she took, you know, some of these ideas from the book. So I thought that was a great idea. And I know that that, that page has been given to those 20 people from Sudbury, but I think that someone talked about putting that document in the chat as well for people to have access to. So thanks to Eugenia, um, the Guidance for Settler Canadians page. And yeah, just thanks to everyone so much for coming. So I'm gonna turn it back over to um, Michelle, who's gonna do our final two draws, and then we're gonna have some discussion. Great, thanks Liz. The uh, next draw, oh, I should share my screen. There we go. The Wheel of Fortune. I always wanted to go on that show. So we have the 20 Sudbury people. I'll shuffle the names here. And this is going to win you a um, gift card. Yes? No, nope. this is gonna be a book. This is the book here, Living in Indigenous Sovereignty. Here we go. Awesome. So Cheyenne, if you can send me your address and then, or uh, Tanya, your address, and we will get that book mailed to you right away. The next straw that we we're going to do, you're so welcome on the Wheel of Fortune is for everyone. So this is uh, another draw for another book. And um, everyone's names are in here who registered. I'm going to shuffle. Michelle, sorry to interrupt. This one's for the Starbucks gift card, $20 gift card. Oh, sorry, Starbucks gift card. The only thing is, is you have to take me out for a cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here we go. Who's it gonna be? Tula, I hope I said that right. Congrats, that's for the Starbucks gift card. So Tula, if you can, um, same thing, send me your address and we will mail that out to you right away. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, the next thing we would have been waiting for, I'm sure you have lots of questions. So we're gonna open up the question um, and answer portion of this book launch. So if you feel uncomfortable, maybe you don't wanna show that beautiful face online to the big world, uh, you can just send a message to Tanya and she can ask it for you in the chat. You can send it privately or you can send it to everyone. Um, so the first question we have, if you have one, go ahead and send it. Um, I'm just going to look here. I don't see any in the chat yet, but does anyone have a question for any of the authors? And feel free to just unmute yourself and, and jump right in. Don't be shy. How did you end up in this line of research, uh, researching how to live under Indigenous sovereignty? So oh, is that, I suppose that's directed to me, Julie? Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> the other authors too, I'm interested in how people in general ended up in this line. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can start out for me and then if others want to join in. So um, for me, um, and I, I talk about the story a little bit in the book, and I think for um, all of the other um, white settler people who were interviewed for the research and whose stories appear in the book, um, that's something that the book does talk about is how did how and why did they get started doing this work. And for me, it was, um, I guess it was mostly when I came to be working, um, I, I, I'm originally from the States and I lived in Minneapolis and I came to be working at an Indigenous alternative school before I really knew much at all about Indigenous people and really didn't have any conception of colonialism, but it was um, through people at that school and through some of the events that um, I had the the opportunity to event, to attend, sorry, that, um, that I, it really got me starting to think and to learn. And um, it just came like over time with different kinds of um, interactions that I had that I realized like to me, this is, you know, like 
this um, genocide of colonialism is a, um, a foundational um, injustice of these lands and, and of Canada, and that this is one of the most important things that I can work on in my lifetime. So that's kind of how it came for me. And um, I just as Victoria shared, and as, as um, many of the people whose chapters are in the book share as well, is that, um, you know, like making mistakes along the way and learning, and sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back, or three steps back. But just um, one of the messages that was so strong from the people involved with the book is not to give up and to keep going forward, you know, and to keep doing the work in whatever ways that we can and in whatever context that we can. So I don't know, that's a, a bit of a vague um, answer, but I, it would be a, a long, a long time to tell you a detailed answer, but lo lots of, like, I'm happy to say that the book does talk about that a lot, you know, that is one of the things is to help people understand, you know, how, how do people get started on this journey, but not only that, but um, once they get started on the journey, like how do they learn? How do they grow? How do they um, learn from their mistakes? How do they uh, enter into relationship with um, with indigenous peoples and lands? And what are some of the ways that they can do their work and they have done their work? So I don't know if other people would want to respond to that. I see Victoria's finger is up. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I talk about it in my interview a bit too, but one thing that really helped me was actually I spent some time in Southern Africa um, and looking back at Canada through the lens of uh, racism, apartheid, all that kind of stuff really made uh, colonial relations very clear to me, maybe clearer than they had been before. And, and I just want to acknowledge that that's been something that um, I really learned from and from people who worked on uh, the anti-apartheid struggles. Thank you for your answers. We have another one in the chat from Will Morin and he's asking, in the working together, how was this process a path to healing or dealing with trauma? I suppose that's for anyone. Feel like I want to give other people a chance to and if, if no one has a thought I'll, um, I'll, I'll respond as well. Liz are there other authors here who might want to speak to that? Yeah so um, Chickadee I consider an author she's one of the authors of the afterward and um, I see Dave Bleakney here and I, I that's just on the first page here. Um, let's see here. Lots of people who are involved and just trying to see the ones that are. Um, I see a Monique, that might be Monique Waroniak. Um, yeah, I guess people could also self-identify if they if they were one of the authors and if they have a, a oh, Dave has his hand up. I'm just trying to, to read the, the, the question again, because I, I think I, I don't see it in my in my chat. Um, but the question of trauma came up, and I, as a settler person, I have to say uh, that, we're, that, that the, tr the real traumas are general cluelessness. Um, uh, of course, you know, observing things that have been done in my name to others is, uh, is, is relatively traumatic, but nothing like what has been generated by colonialism on the original people in this land. So... Um, I come to it from a sense of uh, empowerment, actually, and most of my learning has been done by listening to uh, stories of Indigenous people. And uh, in fact, it hasn't traumatized me or, or uh, it's actually made me feel more powerful and more connected. And, and while I wouldn't want to suggest that, uh, you know, like we, we know the phenomena of people purloining the culture and practices of others, uh, and so I wouldn't want to come across that way, but I will say that one of the biggest things for me is uh, Indigenous values because they resonate with me because they're about connectedness of all things and all living things. And I think uh, all of us need that. Um, so I don't see it as, as for me personally, because I haven't gone through a lot of stuff as, as traumatic, but just really amazing potential for us as settlers to liberate ourselves from our own colonial structures and um, 
uh, cluelessness in the practices that we do every day and we do them unconsciously because it's just been ingrained that this is how it is and it's a it's a pretty twisted uh, thing so I guess in that there's there's uh, some trauma when you come to realize that but also with the the power and struggle of others is, is just deeply inspiring thanks Victoria I see she would like to respond to thanks Dave yeah, I, I just say that um, I, I think it's more that sometimes uh, reactions I've had have pointed me to the fact that I need to deal more with my own stuff, that my stuff is getting in the way. <laughs> and and that, that that's just depends what stuff you have, if it gets in the way or not. Um, and I've also recognized at times that the, you know, the painful, really painful moments, like that's one of the few ways that settlers actually do feel any of the pain of colonialism. Uh, it's obviously nothing like generations of trauma that Indigenous people have, have experienced. Um, but that sometimes all of that comes between us in very painful ways. And if you're trying to build relationships, it can be painful when they don't work. But I, I'd also say, yeah, and I agree with Dave uh, that I've been very nurtured, you know, through uh, ceremony at times, through indigenous people's teachings, through their um, you know, friendship, all kinds of things. Yeah, I think I would add to thank you, Victoria. Um, like, I mean, and I think I look at your question, Will, and I can think about it in, in different ways. Like, I can think about it um, from a settler's perspective and, and my familiarity with the stories that were told in the book. Um, there's a, a person with the pseudonym Franklin who talks about this quite a bit in his story and talks about how, um, like the, almost like the, the trauma of toxic masculinity that, that he grew up with and how that affected him emotionally to be repressing his emotions. But then when he started to get connected with indigenous communities, the way that that helped him be to become more whole and to be able to, um, to work with emotion and be comfortable with emotion and be able to express and, and all those kinds of things. But I also know that sometimes it's the, um, working with settlers that can trigger the trauma of indigenous people too, right? So um, that, you know, I've certainly been part of causing harm in that way. And um, so I think that in some ways that this working together, it can help us with our traumas, but in some ways it can trigger <laughs> trigger our, our traumas as well. And and I have heard though some, um, some indigenous folks who are involved with this project um, say things that it, like that it's giving them more hope for their, for their children's generations when they see non-Indigenous people stepping up and, and trying to do better. And I, is Dave, is your hand up a second time? No, okay, and Victoria's is. Okay. Just, just wanted to add that, um, oh, except now I've forgotten my point. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll come back. Your hand up. Chickadee, did you say? Yes, go ahead, Chickadee. Looks like you're on mute. Well, just from my own um, understanding and, and sitting with the elders and, and, you know, some of the knowledge keepers, um, they had men, made mention, they said the settlers were already traumatized when they came this way. A lot of the settlers had come from, you know, um, a, a lot of the colonization practices that happened all over the world. So they came here already traumatized with some of the you know, um, ills that some have carried from, you know, th their countries. So from my understanding is that, you know, that they came here already traumatized and then terrorized us with their traumatization. And so that's the way I understand it. You know, like the colonization practices, they were colonized in their countries and they came here and colonized, but they used the same practices with the traumas that they imposed on us. And I also, what I was going to say was, I also understand why, uh, you know, Indigenous people might not want to work with uh, white people. And, you know, also why there's a lot of alliance building between Black and 
people of color and indigenous people right now like that you know there's a shared understanding there a share and, and at least some kinds of shared experiences that i will never understand in the same way and i i recognize that and i try to learn from that which um we have a another very great question in the chat here and it's from bobby joe i i suppose this is for any author they ask when I refer to my coworkers, family, friends that are non-Indigenous, how do I make them feel I'm sharing a story as opposed to calling them white and how to help them become an ally? Yeah, it's funny. Um, I'll just talk a little bit and then we'll see what other people want to say too. Like, um, it's funny. I um, <laughs> I had this experience recently, you know, like I'm I'm part of what I do is, is teach courses and, um, and I had an experience where I got this feedback um, from a student saying that I was being um, really hurtful by using the word white in the classroom, right? Um, so I think that there is a lot of, um, a lot of that, um, you know, it really is fragility, right? Like that people, like a lot of people who are, who are non-Indigenous, who are white, they really don't want to be reminded of anything that connects to the harm that's been done by their group structurally and individually within um, Canada, right? So that um, there's a lot of defensiveness that can come up and a lot of like that fragility. So um, like, I, I think you're asking a really good um, question, Bobby Joe is um, like, how do you work with that, you know? Um, and I think that sometimes it depends on the relationship that you have and you're talking about coworkers, friends and family. And um, I think sometimes, um, yeah, like I like what you asked about how do I make them feel I'm sharing my story. I found that to be really effective when I'm speaking from my own experience, you know, like instead of you this and you that, instead like um, this is, you know, my experience in my life. This is what I learned. This is when, you know, like when I struggled, this is like how I've made mistakes. This is how I had to deal with my own defensiveness, you know, like those kinds of stories. I find that, that that's really effective. And that's one of the reasons why our film project, we call it stories of decolonization and we're focusing on stories. And that's what the book is doing too, right? Is focusing on the stories of people because I find that that's a really good way to bypass the defensiveness because how can you argue with someone's story and someone's experience, you know? Like we really, I think we really have a, a, a that, that there's a way that stories that we let them in, in ways that we don't maybe let in um, arguments or, um, you know, positions or things like that. So um, I, that's what I would have to say, but I bet that some of the other authors have some okay. more important things to say about that. Anyone else? Um, I'll just say for myself that um, there was a shift in my understanding when I went from when actually it was a relative who said to me, you're just wallowing in guilt. And she was really mad at me. And, and I stopped and I thought, well, actually, it's not guilt. I wasn't there when some of these things happened. Uh, it's grief. And there's a mourning, I think, that we have to allow ourselves to do. And mourning is something that we can all do. And, and you can move through mourning to action and to other things. Um, so I think there's, there, there's different ways to process the emotions that come up. I always love to hear you talk about that, Victoria. So the next question that we have um, in the chat is, how do you ground yourselves without feeling angry, the sense that your land was taken? And how can we mobilize together so every Indigenous community will have safe drinking water? Um, this person says they're an immigrant uh, on Indigenous land for 20 years.
Hello? Yeah. Go ahead, Tickety. Well, I think that question is towards me. I'm Indigenous. This is my homeland. And I know nothing else. My ancestors know nothing else. We've, we've always known we've been here. And um, sometimes in the beginning of our healing, we, we get angry. And then we realize, um, you know, that when we realize who we are in our, our in our gete, get na Nishnabe, you know, that old ancient Nishnabe way, then we realize, you know, that, you know, this, this land, we made treaties and prayer. And so uh, we abide by those prayers. You know, those prayers are part of who we are that we, we, we don't let them, you know, go to the wayside or we don't, you know, we, we honor those prayers and share the lands. But that hasn't been the case, you know, for the ones that came and made the treaties with us. You know, we're still a people that celebrate treaties all indigenous people all over still celebrate treaties. But, you know, um, and then we get over it. You know, we get over the anger, you know, and, and we never surrendered. We never surrendered anything. They were all made in prayers and treaties. But yet, you know, there's, they call it crown land out there. But to me, it's like, it's it's our, our homeland, you know, like where we gathered, where we, been hunting, you know, where we went fishing, we still have those places intact. You know, it's never gone anywhere. And, and for someone to say, you know, someone stealing your land um, or taking your land, that's not the case. I think, you know, the newcomers need to be educated, you know, and as soon as they get here, you know, knowing the, the, the areas, you know, of, of our people. And a lot of things are still intact. They haven't gone anywhere. You know, I, I still gather medicines, you know, that go back, you know, generations. You know, my father inherited the area, so we still go to, you know, I know of seven generations. My dad's great great grandfather that took them there, he remembers as a child. Then he takes us there. I take my daughter there, my granddaughter there. So we know the land intimately, you know, because the land has, has given us those medicines, has given us the food to sustain us. You know, for as long as the land sustains us um, as a people, and when it ceases to sustain us as a people, then everybody else it, it will, will cease to, the land will, will also cease to sustain them. So we're all responsible and accountable, you know, in, in, the, in the ongoing life of the land and the waters. We're all responsible to one another. You go ahead, Chickadee, for your message. I hope that answers your question. Um, Pea cake. I hope I said that right. Um, another question that I have, um, let me just pull it up here. Um, does the book include any stories of non white people? who are learning to decolonize while at the same time facing racial profiling and racism in their own lives? This is a really good question. And it was, um, and it relates to some of the struggles that, um, that I had in the beginning of designing the research. And like, maybe I made the wrong decision, but ultimately my decision was um, that I wanted to learn how to live in indigenous sovereignty as me, right? As, as a white settler, as someone that has that social location. I think that um, white settler people have a unique position in relationship to colonialism that, that um, you know, like there's elements that a lot of people share, but I think it's, it's a particular position to be doing this work from. And I think it's a position of, um, you know, like a, some of the most privilege you can have, although certainly um, white settler people, there's people living in poverty, people that are marginalized um, because of gender and, um, and sexual orientation, gender orientation and disability and all kinds of things, you know? So it's not saying that, um, you know, that white settler people are um, never marginalized or anything like that, but I think that there's a, a, a fairly unique um, relationship with colonialism. Um, 
that, um, that I wanted to address. I wanted to learn for myself, how do I as me live in Indigenous sovereignty? And so that was that journey. But I think that um, the, the person who raised the question is bringing up something really important and it is a limitation of the book. Um, it's always my hope that there'll be something in there that everyone can learn from. And during, in some of the chapters where we looked at some of the theoretical things that I was drawing upon authors and scholars that are, I, are looking more at that relationship between, for example, indigenous and black people or indigenous and people of color, you know? And so there's a little bit in there where I, you know, like where we looked at that. Um, but I think that it is a big weakness of, of the book and it's one that we're seeking to correct in our um, film project. So we went back with our film project and interviewed a really expanding group of people and um, people from many different identity groups and um, that are working on decolonization and understanding their identities in relationship to colonialism. And um, so we're really excited about, about um, being able to offer something that, that, um, that is, reaches out to more people and, and allows that, those broader discussions. Um, and also, um, yeah, like I think it's a really good question and it's a really good point that's come up before and I appreciate, um, I appreciate, um, I don't know who that is, I didn't see that one, but thank you so much for, for asking that question and I think that you're right to ask that. I don't know if other people have any thoughts. I, I just want to say one thing is I think that that leaves a lot of room for more discussion in public forums, at conferences, and for more writing on that topic, because I think it's very much um, in the news, it's relevant now, and people are questioning what can happen. Thanks, Tula. And Tula was my um, advisor of my PhD, so I'm so glad that she's here. And yeah, like that is true. And I think Victoria mentioned before that um, the scholarship around the relationships between indigenous people and people of color and black people has really, really exploded. Like there's so much more out there and, and there's so much more of a focus on solidarity and those relationships within the activism where like, like Victoria said, some indigenous people are like, I'm done working with white people. I'd rather work with someone that understands how to deal with white supremacy or that's impacted by white supremacy, you know? And so um, like, I, I think, you know, for me, like I really try to honor that because I know that I'm not as safe in, in some ways as perhaps sometimes people of color can be in those solidarity relationships. So I think it's, really good and I encourage people that are that are living those questions to to um, to, to do that work and to and to share to share your insights that you gain when you're doing that work to help um, create those um, those teachings for others. That was a great question um, and some equally great answers. So I'm just being mindful of the time. It's almost 8 p.m. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people have more questions, but I'll start to wrap up now by uh, thanking everyone for coming and um, being here for this exciting book launch. If you want, again, I wanna remind you that it's 25% off and the link is in the chat. So I'll pass it back to Liz who will have the final words, miigwech. Oh my goodness, I wasn't prepared for final words. <laughs> so, I mean, I my final words would be just again, thank you to the amazing community that's took, taken part in creating the book, but also the amazing community that's here to celebrate with us tonight. And for all of your questions and your insights, like I know that there's some um, thoughts that have been shared in the chat that weren't exactly questions, but I, I honor those. And those are really, really good and profound things that people are, are sharing. And I wanna thank you for that. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for, um, and I actually have not held the book in my hand yet. I'm waiting for it to come in the mail, but that'll be a great day. I'm really excited for that. And I'm really just grateful. Oh, Michelle has it. She's making me jealous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's bigger than I thought. Hey, it looks kind of big. I thought it would be like a bit more small. Wow, okay. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, and for all the support, like I see all these people, I see my colleagues on here, a lot of folks from Laurentian, a lot of folks from Winnipeg, a lot of friends from community, and a lot of people that um, that I haven't met before that are that I consider new friends. Thank you so much for being here and, and taking part in this. So I'll probably stay on for a little while longer in case anyone has some other thoughts that you wanna talk about, but otherwise I guess this is the formal closing. Mm. 
Yes, bon mon pied, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, can I just say something? Um, it's Dave. Um, I just wanted to go back to, to what Chickadee had talked about. We brought our traumas with us because I, I, you know, it occurs to me like very much like we're the fish in water, right? We just in the water, we don't see it. But part of that legacy that, that we passed on was like, if we think about our settler culture, a lot of it was based on anger, sin, beating children, putting children to work at young ages, a uh, uh, total lack of nurturing, thinking just making people tough and treating them cruelly would somehow make them good humans. So this is this is kind of what we've been swimming in, I think, as settlers for a long, long time. And, um, um, and of course, it, uh, and commodifying life as well. So uh, that's part of that colonial package. And I, I thank Chickadee for pointing that out of the the carriage of trauma that so that when you just don't see it because you're part of it you're in it and uh i i do think though um i mean it's not one easy answer but we have to get more uh indigenous history and stories into our schools our children have the right and they deserve to know i know as a child i was always asking about the stuff where did they go how come they're not around you know what happened to them and so these are just naturally curious things that children say before they've been filled their heads have been filled so, um, and let's face it, our schools are, are horrible on that question. It's, it's mostly token and, uh, and we don't really get um, the kind of history, uh, the true history of this land. Uh, our, most of it is, has been denied us. So that's, uh, that's one area I think that more work needs to be done. Thanks. I just put the the link to the film project in the chat because Dave says that in the film, eh? We like that's I think one of one of the things I really loved about Dave's interview is that I mean in the way he just kind of went, well, where did they go, right? Like in that he was wondering that as he was growing up and it wasn't talked about. And it was, you know, like I, I really appreciate that the way that you um convey that, you know, that loss and that and that confusion, you know, like of a child growing up in socialized into the settler culture and settler society. And thanks to Scott for putting this in the chat. Yeah, I was at that book launch I and I ordered the book. So it's come and I haven't been able to read it yet. Um, Benita Bunjan's um, book, Academic Wellbeing of Racialized Students. Thanks for putting that in there. Any other thoughts for people that are hanging around? Thoughts or questions or comments? I just want to say thank you to all of you. I've just, it's so inspiring to hear what you have said. And I'm also eager to get the book. It's um, kind of got lost in the mail, but uh, I will get it soon, apparently. So thanks so much. I appreciate everything and look forward to hearing more later. Thanks, Tula. Bye bye. Any other thoughts or comments or thanks to everybody out there for all you're doing. You guys did amazing uh, processes to get the book going and uh, yeah. Love you guys. Love you, Chickadee. Take care. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I could add a comment adding to what I think Dave was saying. Uh, I used to teach Indigenous studies at a at high school level, and one of the things after the first few readings that students did with me that happened almost consistently every single year was that the students would be so angry that no one had told them this stuff before. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there were tears that would come later, but they felt angry and betrayed by the system that had not shared this with them, that they had no idea how deep the uh, colonial wounds were, what had really happened, and they couldn't believe that they'd made it through to high school and never heard this stuff before. Yeah, that's something that um, Monique Oroniak, her chapter in the book, she she really um, focuses on that quite a bit. And she talks about like, she's a librarian and she says, you know, like 
I love information and like just the anger and the hurt that of being deprived of this true information, you know, that and not even knowing that there were um, reserves very close to where she was living and not being able to have those relationships. I mean, that was a big theme in her chapter is um, that um, being robbed of the relationships and the information, you know, so thanks for sharing that. I also had the same experience teaching at the university level. Students are appalled and, they're, and, and they feel so betrayed and they're so angry when they realize they've gone all those years through the educational system and were lied to. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to pipe in again. Uh, we've, I've had the same experience as an educator in our, in our union. Uh, we do pretty intense labor education and uh, a course was developed uh, by Indigenous people called Turtle Island, uh, which talks about history. And of course, there are many histories, of course, across Turtle Island, it's not just one, but uh, they have common themes. And um, uh, when, we, when we put that, and we bring in an elder, wherever we're putting on this course, whatever part of the country, an elder from that area comes in and also tells uh, some of the stories from the area. And we have the same experience, tears, anger, frustration, uh, we see the same thing, yeah. I see a hand up, Megan. Hi, first of all, just miigwetch. Thank you for um, sharing so much and putting the book together. And I just wanna say that I'm coming from um, Comox First Nation and seated in traditional territory. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to go back to that sharing of stories. Um, I'm part of an uh, Indigenous uh, resource group within a corporation right now. And they are looking at um, making a, uh, I don't know if I would say kinder work floor, but just trying to change the environment to the work floor to support um, indigenous hires and um, and basically the conversations we're having is all to do with decolonization, right? I'm, we're talking to uh, people that want to be allies, that want to go forward, but at the same time not really realizing the significant barriers that are in place and trying to change the um, the feelings on the work floor. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned through um, hosting educationals and decolonization courses and speaking with elders and having those opportunities is that the significant change in people really comes from listening to the stories that are shared with them and making those connections. So I always feel like it's our duty to provide space for people to share their own stories, to make those connections, whether um, the people listening are young or old or, so if we ever have those opportunities and that privilege to make space, um, I think that's probably the biggest thing to changing our society and to being able to work together, you know, and, and traveling on the, the same path together or side by side. So, and um, yeah, and a big thank you to my to my union, right? Because they've enabled me to do that kind of work. So just to share with you guys, um, making space when when we can to uh, to listen to others, right? So thank you. Thanks, Megan. I'm always impressed by the amazing work happening in unions and Dave's been a really big part of that too, eh? And I just want to tease Tanya for a second because she always tells me how much her cat hates her. And I just saw her cat come right in there and her hug and kiss her cat. Like, I don't believe it anymore. <laughs> I had to grab her. I had to grab her like really fast. <laughs> Liz, I am going to turn off the recording because I think there are a few people who would rather be off recording if that's okay. <laughs>